What's up everybody? My name is Russ. I'm with rwgresearch.com. Uh, this is another update on the uh, Noble Gas engine um, replication and or just trying to get it to prove the point that it works. Um, today is the 8th of September and uh, some of you have asked me about the Intelligentry Popper Kit. Uh, John, if you watch this, um, where's it at? I don't have it. Um, I'm getting close to the point where I'm just going to ask for a refund because I could use that money somewhere else, to be honest. So, if you get this, you might want to send me an email and let me know what's going on so I can inform everybody else. Dead in the water here with your system. Uh, but nonetheless, continuing on with what I do know and what I do have information about, and that is Bob Broner's setup. And basically, I'm going to be replicating exactly what he has pretty much to the T. Um, obviously, the circuit's going to be custom because uh, I don't have any of that information, but uh, <clears throat> you can find a lot of the other information online. If you just dig for it, you can find it. And what I've done is, if you guys don't know how I do this, um, in the past, when I was... Uh, building the EPG here, which hopefully I'll do some testing soon on that, now that I got the new scope. Great, guys. Um, basically, I go to Google SketchUp, download it, and find one particular piece in a picture that I know what the size actually is. I measure it, I scale the picture until it's just right, and then I completely measure everything else on it, and I can figure out about anything I want. So I'm actually scaling um, to exactly what Bob has, and I've got I've got all the parts ordered, but I've only got like 98% of them here to show you today. So with no further ado, let's get started. Uh, oh, before I go on, I want to tell you about the um, circuit that I'm building uh, that I showed you guys in the last upper popper update video. Basically, uh, I'm still modifying it, want to get it uh, a little more fine-tuned and make sure it's going to work the way I really want it to work and it's not going to damage components in the process. Um, and when I do that, after I do that, I will let you guys know I'll post the schematic over at the forums. Other than that, I've been testing all sorts of different type of capacitors. Um, one thing that I do know that Bob stated in a video, <clears throat> if it's accurate, then if this is accurate. Um, basically, Bob is using a capacitor bank to discharge across the spark gap, just like I did uh, in my last video. And the circuit's probably different. He's uh, using, I think, two um, ignition coils to make his work, where I'm just using a different setup. But the point of how it functions is probably really close to the same. Um, so I have been playing with different types of capacitors. Um, and from what I know, um, in one of his videos, he stated that he is using 330,000 um, microfarads at about 72 volts DC I believe. That brings us somewhere in between around, and I don't know how to say this, uh, the word, the, the unit for energy, it's like jolts or joules or I don't really know, I'm just gonna call it jolts because I like to say it, but uh, he is using approximately between 75 and 100 jolts. Um, if you watch his meter in the background, his voltmeter, you can see him charging the capacitor bank and it gets to somewhere around 72 volts and when he discharges it it drops it back down to maybe 25 volts or something like that so he's really only fluctuating between we'll just say about 50 volts okay so if you calculate out how much energy he's using it's actually probably less because he's not discharging it fully um, and from what I figured out in my experiments that the capacitors if they're not a high enough charge they will not discharge across the gap um, Still trying to calculate if it matters between how many jolts it is, or how many volts it is, or how many amps it is, depending on what the, what the scenario is, or how big the arc is across the gap. I really don't know yet. I'm still trying to play with that, but I've done a lot of experiments lately. Um, all sorts of different capacitors I'm going to show here. And uh, basically, he's using between, what's important here is he's been using between 75 and 100 jolts. All right. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but you guys are going to have to deal with it. Um, so, from what I've learned, my capacitor bank that I discharged and showed you guys with the flash capacitors, I um, had approximately 124 jolts. So I was about 24 over what he's actually using for energy wise. So I got plenty in that little bank, but it takes a little bit for that bank to get charged. Um, I, I got some plans on, on different ways I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to show you all my capacitors and I'll show you. I will try to attach some clips on the end of this video um, of some experiments I did. 
but not sure if I'll have time to do that. So let's move on. Here is all of the capacitors that I own. Um, these right here are low voltage, higher capacitance capacitors. All of these are higher voltage, little bit lower capacitance. Um, these two here, I have to thank my buddy Blaine for sending me. Um, I'll be honest, I've been using these, and these are probably likely the key. I think they're going to work really well. I have seen in the back of one of Bob's pictures um, that you can find on his videos, um, <clears throat> you can find there are some of these in the background. They're a little bit smaller, but no, I don't know about size, but as far as physical dimensions, they're a little bit smaller. These are three or 3,300 microfarads at 350 volt DC. Um, depending on, well, it doesn't matter if you have these hooked up in parallel or series. As long as the charge is the same, you still get the same amount of jolts out of these things, which is approximately 350 jolts max. These are what I've been playing with lately. I love these things. They're working great. These are actually designed to be short-circuited and charged rapidly, so that's probably going to be great for this application. Um, I have charged these up to 350 volts and discharged them in uh, series, or I mean in parallel, and I've also done them in series and um, charged them up to 650 volts in series and discharged them. And the same amount of power, so it's actually easier for me to do it in a lower voltage, a little bit more capacitance. Um, <clears throat> here's this capacitor bank again. Again, this is about uh, 124 jolts at the 100 and, uh, 281 volts. Uh, the capacitance here is, uh, ooh, I don't remember, you're going to have to calculate it. It's 120 microfarads a piece. I think there's 25 of them, 24 of them. Um, these capacitors here are 2700 microfarad and 250 or 200 working volts. These here are 680 microfarads at 400 working volts. These are probably what I'm going to test the most and see if these are going to charge up fast enough for me because this is going to be probably perfect. It's 100 volts at two, or 100,000 microfarads at 250 volts and I got 8 of them so that'll get me 800 um, microfarads or 8,000 microfarads at 250 volts. I probably will only, from my experiments so far, what I've learned is basically when you charge these up um, if I charge this capacitor up to 240 volts and discharge it across my spark gap, what happens is actually I don't get, my voltage doesn't go all the way down. It goes somewhere between 80 and 100 volts. It never goes below that. So even if I have a giant spark across my gap, it doesn't matter. It still doesn't discharge across that. <clears throat> so it's kind of weird. Uh, it makes sense, but it's interesting because it, what I did is try these big caps and then I tried all of these connected together. Check check out these monsters. 78,000 microfarads. All right. At 40 volts DC. Both of these are the same. These came out of some power supplies out of big printers, old school matrix printers. So the the heads on those things were little coils and this thing just pounded away. Um, all these other ones are a little bit smaller, 6,000 microfarads, 3100, um, 3 uh, this one's actually 31,000, but it's only 15 volt DC. Uh, these are even smaller, I think. Yeah, 4,000 at 40 volts. So the problem here is I've charged all these up. I've got quite a bit of jolts here, but not enough voltage to jump my gap. Okay. And so what I'm learning is the higher the voltage, the easier the charge, in my opinion, and the lower the capacitance needs to be. So for instance, to match what Bob has as far as jolts, if I'm using 1,000 volts, which he states that PAP was using 1,000 volts, if I use 1,000 volts, I only need 150 microfarads. So, um, basically, if this cap was at 3,000 volts, or, I'm sorry, if this cap was at 1,000 volts, it would almost be enough. Okay? So that's the, the comparison. Okay? That's a huge difference. And I could hook up, what, three of these? Uh, no, I, I, I ain't going to talk about it. I, I have to calculate it out. But basically what I'm telling you is I personally think that the higher the voltage, the more efficient the system is. I think Bob would agree with that. I think he kind of mentioned that somewhere. Uh, I don't know. But that's what I've been doing with the capacitor side of things. Now let's move on to all of these pieces, parts, and things. Here's my cylinder. Uh, I've already disassembled this cylinder. 
if you'd like to know what part number it is there it is um, I did purchase this off eBay that's just grease in there um, the cylinder looks pretty well there's a few spots that may kind of concern me just a little but I can't really do much about it um, but supposedly this was brand new and it looks brand new it doesn't look like it was used at all uh, the bolts here that hold it together this is the base bottom this is the top this did have cushions uh, cushions on it if you know what I'm talking about if you don't figure it out or uh, I'm not going to try to explain it but cushions are uh, basically what happens the piston comes back and it has a bigger port that fits inside a smaller port with the bleed off on it it allows the the piston to actually have a cushion um, I did go ahead and take this piston off here that was a giant pain in the butt um, but I got it off and the reason it was a pain in the butt is because it was loctited and it was also punched you see the punch right there and the punch right here so I'm gonna have to clean the threads up a little bit and uh, reinstall this now you probably asked me why did you take this thing apart to this extent here's the cups and the seals um, basically the reason I took this apart this far is because if you look at Bob's cylinder he has mentioned he has put a steel cover over the top of this um, I'm actually gonna cut one that looks similar to what the intelligentry um, piston looks like but I'm gonna make it out of steel he mentioned that the original PAP motor is actually steel and not aluminum. Um, so there's a reason for that. He states Bob does. I'm not sure the reason yet. Um, but if you re and all the information that I'm sharing with you right now, about three percent of it actually came directly from Bob. The rest of it I've just done research. I've got online. I've looked up all the videos. I have them all saved. I've looked through every little thing, I've looked at it detail over and over and over, and I've studied it a lot. Okay, so if you're asking me how I know so much about Bob's system, it's because he has actually posted information online. You just have to go look at it. Um, let's see here. The next thing I guess I'll talk about are these right here. These are welding electrodes. Alright, tungsten electrodes. Um, these are a quarter inch by seven inches long five pieces they are thoriated two percent thoriated now let me set the camera down I'm gonna pull this out of here and I'll show you what it looks like these I could not believe how, how much these were um, the red on the end indicates they're thoriated um, there's different colors for different type of electrodes these are like I said tungsten and uh, they have a ground finish, so they're nice and finished. Um, let's put it this way. <clears throat> Air Gas, which is a, a, a normal supplier of this type of stuff, they quoted me $350 for five of these. Um, I looked online, and I called locally just to see what they wanted for them. <clears throat> I looked online, found them for about $210, and somehow, um, probably because somebody's looking out for me. I actually got these for only $89. So we went from $350 to $89, but nonetheless, if you're not careful and you don't find it, uh, you just got to Google these. That's all I got for you. You have to look and look and look. I don't remember the website. Welding, WeldingDirect.com or something like that. Um, so those are really expensive, but I think <clears throat> they fit the application well because they're thoriated. They have thorium within them. Um, and that's going to be an important value for what I'm doing. All right, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. The next thing are the fittings. If you look at Bob's device, you will find out that he has fittings. Um, this is a long nut. It's called a long nut compression. This is a three eighths, and then these are the three eighths by three eighths, three eighths tubing by three eighths brass. Um, fittings and then what you do is you take the end off and it's got the brass sleeve in here that tightens down on it to keep it uh, tight and what you do is you take one of these o-rings put it in oh I gotta put it in the right one these two components go away take this o-ring press it down in here I might have to get different size o-rings and now what you have is a removable um, 
a removable system. So what I what I got to get yet I ordered. Shelly's fitting here just nice. This is what he's using on his on his system. Again, all this information I dug up by researching and looking. I spent many, 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 many hours doing this. But basically what he's got, and he mentioned this, he's got a piece of Teflon tubing. And the Teflon tubing is quarter inch uh, inside diameter, three eighths inch outside diameter. So it fits perfectly in here. And these quarter inch uh, tungsten rods fit perfectly inside of that tubing. And then all you have to do is tighten it down and it's sealed. Perfect. That's genius. Bob, great, great setup. That's why I'm replicating it, because it looks like it just works well. Um, you, you've done an excellent job, so my hat's off to you. Um, the other thing about the uh, Teflon tubing, it's like 50 foot roll is like $350, and a thousand foot or a hundred foot roll is like uh, 500 plus. It's ridiculous. You can buy it from McMaster Car for $6 a foot or more, like $6.25 a foot. Um, I only really need a couple feet, so the minimum order is like, you know, 10 feet for some websites. I'm like, this is crazy. So I got on eBay and found some on there. Somebody is selling it by the foot. If you can, can't find it, they are selling it by the foot. It's like $2.50 a foot, so I bought like 10 feet. Very reasonably priced, brand new. Um, so keep these things in mind. You're going to have to do a lot of research if you want to find the parts and not spend thousands of dollars. Um, Pete can agree with me there. He knows all the details on all the information I've been trying to get. So, those how that's how those work. Now, as far as the inlets, the gas inlets, uh, and the vacuum inlet and the pressure gauge, this is uh, the closest thing I could find to what Bob was using, and uh, it should work just fine. Uh, the, these did come with a bunch of different style handles. These are quarter inch by quarter inch. Uh, pipe thread, um, yeah, it look, yeah, it's pipe thread. Almost didn't look like it there for a second. Um, and those will fit right in the chamber. Like I said, just uh, Google all this information because that's basically what I did. Last thing I got here is the sight glasses. I was pretty stoked to find these. Um, these are stainless steel, but uh, you can see the sight glass. It's 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 reasonable. You can see through it pretty well. If it'll focus, there you go. So the side glass is actually pretty pretty clear. Uh, these are like uh, I think these are 1400 psi. The smaller ones, these are three quarter inch. The half inch ones were like 1650 psi. That should be plenty. I'm not sure if this is a casted glass or a, a polymer, but it's casted in there. You can see how it's not round or flat. I mean, it's rounded, so it's actually a cast kind of cool. Um, if you would like to know about these parts right here, all right, where I purchased them at was zorotools.com and um, there is the part numbers, part numbers and uh, type of information for each one. That right there is actually, you can google that number, you'll find it. So if you want to know which pieces I got, there you go. Um, other than that, Oh, uh, charging capacitors. That's enough for the parts. That's about all I got right now. The tubing is the only thing left. I will be making the other parts as soon as I get some of my dimensions done, and I'll publish that information when I get it finished. Um, back to the charging of capacitors really quickly. I have uh, a tooling transformer, uh, which is basically a step-down transformer from like 480 to 120, and uh, I've, I've got it hooked up backwards, and I'm charging these capacitors with that. Um, if I charge these from like 80 volts to 350 volts excuse me it takes quite a bit of current uh, but if I only charge them from like 80 volts to like 175 which is in the range that I need for the amount of jolts that Bob is using so I should be able to match that then I should be just fine um, the other thing I want to try is if I need a thousand volts maybe you guys can throw me some ideas of charging. I was talking to Tin Man and Tin Man said, why don't you use a microwave oven transformer? They're like, what, 5,000, uh, 2,000 volts um, at like 500 milliamps. So, decent amount of current. I do have one here, but I'm going to have to test it. Looks like I had a blowout at one time. Not sure what happened. So, I'm going to have to test that one. But, um, 
Other than that, I was actually using a neon sign transformer through a standard 1000 volt diode rectifier uh, and getting to charge these capacitors. So um, you can do it that way, but it's only like 30 milliamps for most of those things and they take forever. It probably takes two or three minutes to charge these caps up to 700 volts where I can charge them up with a standard uh, tooling transformer hooked up backwards um, with pro probably to 250 volts, no, to, to 350 volts it took about, I don't know, a second and a half to two seconds. But if I went from 80 volts to 175 or 180 volts, it was only like a half a second to a quarter second. So we're, we're getting into the range where I think I can actually match the 120 revs per minute that Bob was trying to reach in one of his videos. Um, I think if we get the right capacitors and the right system set up, I think we can do that. Um, I have confidence that it will work. I just need to make sure that the system will actually function. The gas will actually do its plasmatizing situation. Piston will move. Once that is functional, I can really focus on timing. But for now, it's really just fire it once, does it work? Um, but my circuit will have all that stuff engineered into it, which is why I'm not publishing yet, because I'm not quite done. So. Uh, that's it. I'm going to leave you go. Uh, once again, if I look tired, it's because I am. I always make these videos at the end of my day, which is in the morning for everyone else, and I'm always about to fall asleep. So, peace and love to you all. Thank you for the support, and please go over to open-source-energy.org and look for the Let's Build a Popper thread and read the information there, okay? Um, if you want to know more about this, that's a good place to go. Um, Bob's website is ronermachine.com. Uh, just Google that and uh, you'll find it. Uh, if you would like to go to John's website, you can do that. It's Intelligentry. Um, yeah, enough said about that. When I uh, get a little more information from John, I'll let you know. But right now I'm kind of like, hey, uh, I don't really, uh, yeah, things and stuff. I got an RF amplifier sitting back here. I'll give it my best shot. High voltage coils are easy to get a hold of. It's not like they're giving me anything I don't have. The electronics are so special that only they can make them. So, yeah, I think we could probably, we have enough people over at the open-source-energy.org forum to probably make these circuits if we wanted to. But at this point, it's proof of concept. But then we can work on that later. So that's it. Russ, with RW Research here, I am out. Five hundred volts. This is going to be six hundred and fifty volts.
Firing. Three, two, one. Leftover voltage after that. 100 volts. 100 volts left over.